Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church, everybody. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online as well. Great to see everybody today. We're in the summer, so we have uh, we have some of these weekends where we've got some people traveling, but it's still good to see so many of you here this morning. Praise God. Uh, we're going to worship the Lord now. I hope that's why you gathered together. I was just praying with a brother in my office and, and uh, you know, one of the things that came up in our prayer is how the assembly of the church, it's not like a religious thing where we go through our week and then we get together on Sunday to remember God and then we just go back to our lives. It's actually like a reunion of people who have been serving God all week. So my, that's my prayer is that, and hope for you is that, well, that was our prayer indeed this morning, is that that's what this would be. People who have gathered, who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, have devoted themselves to serving him in the gospel with whatever opportunities and gifts and strength that he supplies. And then when we got to get, gather together, it's a gathering of those who love him to worship him and praise him and be further edified and strengthened for the work that we're called to. Amen? Does that sound like the right, the right approach? Let's praise him together. Would you all stand up with me, please? Welcome once again. Let me open us with a prayer. And then we're going to say, oh, uh, please accept my apologies for the fact that we don't have the illuminated words on the screen today. So hopefully we've got some songs that will be easy for you to just follow along and should be familiar. In fact, the first song is one where we sing a line and then you repeat back to us. So that's as easy as it can be, right? All right. So uh, let's bow before the Lord now and let's pray. Almighty and most holy Yahweh. You are the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Israel. You are the God who called the children of Israel out of Egypt under Moses. You're the God of Joshua, the God of Samuel. You're the God of David. And you are, of course, the God and father of that, that great descendant of David, prophesied, the son of David, the son of man, the son of God, our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. The one who said before Abraham was, I am, hallelujah, our blessed, wonderful Lord Jesus, almighty Father, holy Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, led and guided by you, God, the Holy Spirit in us. And Lord Jesus, we pray that this service, this assembly today would magnify your name and strengthen your children, your disciples to just follow you harder and serve you more and remain steadfast and endure all hardships in service to you. We know you will come again one day and we pray, Lord God, that we would faithfully occupy and watch and pray and serve and preach and be faithful as we await the great return of you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May everything that happens in here today honor you and please you and be for the edification of your children and accomplish your purposes. Hallelujah. We pray, Lord, today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, who wants to sing with me today? Who wants to worship and praise the Lord? Here we go, everybody. If you're watching at home, sing along with us. Sing right along with us. Here we go. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. Oh, 
yes, he is worthy of our praise, and yes, he alone is worthy of our praise. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. This is called Let Faith Arise.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, listen, listen now to God's word as Deacon Steve reads for us this morning. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him, came up to show him all the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone will be left here upon one another, and shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anger for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead. And I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow.
the redeemed. Grace. Not those who deserve it. Those who have been redeemed by His grace through faith. Let's sing that hymn. Fanny, come on up here. And the, all the other singers that join in this, come on up here, guys. And let's sing that hymn, number 521. Re redeemed. Love this hymn. Wonderful. Let's go. Redeemed. <laughs>
reach this one. And let me, let's, uh, okay, you want, you want to do it now? Yeah, let's do it now. Okay, Angie's going to sing a song for us now, and then we'll have our prayer time, okay? Here we go. Thank you, Angie. Praise God. And hopefully you were praying along with that. I was, and 
That's what we need day after day after day is the forming and shaping of our hearts by God. I, I've been, uh, well, I won't go into details because I don't want to belabor it, but that's something that's been in my mind a lot is just, I read a passage from Psalm 119 yesterday. It was text and Deacon Bob about a little bit and we were going back and forth. And <clears throat> One of the stanzas in Psalm 19 says things like, cause my heart to love you, cause my heart to long your word, cause my lips to speak your truth, cause my hands to walk in your ways. I'm, well, it, was, it was cause, 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 and asking the Lord to work in us. I hope that's a regular part like that song, you know, change my heart, may I be like you, right? That should be the desire of every Christian's heart is that God, you know, so many times we pray and we pray, we're praying for things that we want God to do and God to change. We're praying for people we know that are sick, that God would make them well. But that's fine. But I hope, I hope that your prayers are including, perhaps even dominated by, this desire for God to work in your heart and to make us more like him as we continue to walk and live in this world until he comes. For that is really the true desire, I think, of every Christian is to is to serve him and to represent him well. We want as people see us walk, as people listen to us talk, as we engage people, we want them to in some way to encounter Jesus, ultimately leading to the fact that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The ultimate thing that we want is that opportunity to preach the gospel to every creature, right? Thank you, God. So, but be praying, be praying in your own prayers that the Lord just day after day after day, just keep coming back to it, works in your heart to make you more and more like him in all humility and in all love and in all faithfulness. Let's have a time of prayer now and maybe pray about that as a congregation, okay? And some other things. Let's bow before the Lord and let's all pray together. <clears throat> Almighty, most holy Yahweh, you are the potter and we're clay. You are the sovereign one with power over everything. You are the one who, even way back in the day for your own purposes, when you had Moses standing before Pharaoh, you would harden Pharaoh's heart and, and cause him to not let them go because you had control over even the heart of somebody, Lord God. You are the one that opens people's hearts. Your word says that nobody can come to you unless you draw them, Lord God. So you're sovereign over the heart. And so we come to you with our own hearts today. And we pray, Lord God, that you would make us more like you. We look at our blessed Lord Jesus as we read of him on the pages of Holy Scripture. And we see a humble servant. We see one who above all loved you. We see one who was bold and courageous. We certainly see one who put basically everybody except you, Father, ahead of himself. Uh, really, Lord God, amazing, amazing. We bless you and we praise you and we pray that you would make us more like yourself, our blessed Lord Jesus. Make us more like you. Fill us with a spirit of humility, faithfulness, love, graciousness towards one another and towards those around us. Not a hint of haughtiness, not a hint of like, you know, despising of others because we ourselves feel like we've arrived at something. Help us when we see weakness in others around us to remember our own weakness. Make us more like you, Lord, humble. Blessed are the meek, you said. Make us like that, Lord God. Make us meek and yet courageous and bold and full of love. Those of us who have been by your grace redeemed, saved through the gospel of Christ, make us more like you to serve you. <coughs> Let your will be done in each one of us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for the ministry of our church. We pray, Lord God, even thinking of our vacation Bible school that's coming up, you know, we don't just want to have fun for people, Lord God, though we want it to be that, but it doesn't really matter what we want. Lord, we want you to be served. We desire that children and their families would be gathered so that we may preach the gospel to them. 
I thank you for every worker who's preparing now, and I thank you in advance for every child and every member of their families who will come and look in on and listen in on these things. And we pray you would open the hearts of people. We pray that you'd bring many people and that you'd open the hearts of those who are yours to believe the gospel of Christ, that they might repent and believe and be saved. Please, Lord God. We remember in our congregation, Lord God, some who need a touch from you, Lord God. Um, we certainly remember our sister April, Lord God, and thankful that she's here with us today. And we pray, Lord God, that you would continue to bless her and help her and strengthen her and let your will be done, Lord God, in her life and her family. And just thank you for her presence today. We remember to you our brother Ron. We pray that your will would be done in his life, Lord God, that you'd give him strength and and encouragement in his heart and in his spirit. Thank you for our brother Paul being there with us today, Lord God, and thank you for the work that you did in him and helping him and helping him and his family. And we pray that his faith would continue now to grow strong and you'd continue to guide him and help him. Thank you for Victor and Josh being here with us today, both of them, Lord, and I pray you continue to help them and strengthen them, Lord God, and help their faith in you to grow and to flourish and to be strong and help them with the needs, Lord, that they have in their bodies. We think of others, Lord God. I, I think of our sister Linda. Thank you for helping her with her leg. I think of our sister Heather, Lord God, and I pray that you help her with any battle or struggle she has, Lord, you know, with her eyes. We think, Lord God, of, of some of the the family members, Lord God, of, of those of us who are here that, that are ill and sick, we pray that you would touch them and provide healing for them. But more than that, that you'd open hearts to the gospel of Christ. A physical healing is a beautiful thing, and we ask for it, Lord, and we know that you can do it. But a physical healing of someone that doesn't know you, <laughs> I mean, that's only good for a very short temporary season. Above all, we pray that you would move on the hearts of people that they would come to repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and that you would give us boldness to not just show concern for physical needs, but show concern for souls and reach out with the gospel of Christ. Make us all, Lord God, missionaries, evangelists. Make us all, Lord God, people who reach out with the gospel of Christ, inviting people, giving out literature, just sharing of ourselves and representing you well. As you said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's a serious call. You command it, you're worthy of it, you deserve it, that we should obey it. Help us to humble ourselves and take that seriously. Strengthen us, Lord God. Thank you for our church. Thank you for each person who's here. Thank you for anyone else, Lord, who needs some touch, some encouragement from you. Help us to love one another, to bear with one another, to forgive one another, even as you and Christ Jesus have forgiven us. And help us to rejoice in your love and your redemption and your salvation, which transcends all earthly trouble. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for praying with me. All right. Good morning once again, everybody, and God bless you. Let me give you a couple of announcements and then we'll have our, our Sunday school class go downstairs. Uh, first of all, um, we have well, Vacation Bible Schools coming. That should be first, right? That's pretty obvious. Yeah, praise God. We've had some kids sign up. Um, we, this is the really crucial week now. I issued a little bit of a challenge last week and I'll reissue it today. I think if every individual in our church would just make it their mission to see that one child at least makes it to this vacation Bible school, that would be a wonderful thing. And I feel like that's an attainable goal, right? But what's necessary is for every person sitting in the room and those listening online to say, yes, yes, I'm going to throw myself into that and pray about it and see that you can invite and get kids to come here. Um, it starts one week from tomorrow night, July 10th. It runs every evening through Friday night, and it starts at 6.30 every night. And the closing of each session around, uh, what is it, close at 9 o'clock, I think, like around 8.30, we open up the doors and, and families can come in and watch the night-by-night -night ongoing skit that's going on. That's what a lot of this is about up here. 
and there's presentations of the gospel, especially on Friday night, where I'll have the opportunity to share the gospel with everyone who's gathered. There'll be teaching in the classroom in the back. Every single night, the gospel of Christ will be shared throughout all of the different things the kids do. Everything in one way or another incorporates that. That should be something that you, as a part of Fellowship Bible Church, should say, I want to thrust my energies into this to help it and make it success. And even if you're not on the team that's conducting the evenings, the biggest and most important things that you can do are pray for the ministry that it happens that week and to make it your mission to try to get a kid or kids to come here and be part of it, okay? It's free. Um, they can call, and some have done this already now. There are calls coming in and people leaving messages pre-registering for it. They don't have to do that. They can come that night and register, but best thing to do would be to call and leave a message and, 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 and give some information to me so I can get you pre-registered. But here it is. It starts a week from tomorrow. It's been three years since we've done it, so maybe we'll be starting, starting a little small, but there's no reason why we need to like settle for just having a few kids. We're prepared to have a bunch. Let's go get them, all right? All right? Yeah? Hey. Hey, we're Christians. We sing songs like, I'm going to rise one day because Christ has conquered the grave. And I love to proclaim that I'm redeemed. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, right? Do you love? Do you? Do you? Do you love to proclaim it? I do. I really do. And not just to you. I love to go out and just proclaim to people that I meet. You know, maybe offer them some literature and encourage them to think about God, who is our Redeemer, a little bit. If you love to proclaim yourself as redeemed of God, then it shouldn't be hard for you to own this one, man. Take this vacation Bible school that's coming up and make it yours. This is your church, man. Make this yours. Go out and invite some kids to come in and pray about it, and let's just have a smashing, successful week before the Lord. Amen? Amen. No reason why that shouldn't happen if everybody says, yes, I will do this. Do you agree? Yes. Can you say amen? Can you wake up and participate with me, please? Do you say amen to this? Yes. All right? Hallelujah. Let's do this, everybody. This is what we're here for. Let's do this. Hallelujah. All right. Tuesday night, prayer time. Well, Bible study, I'm sorry. Tuesday night, 8 o'clock Bible study, 9 o'clock prayer time. Wednesday night, youth group at 6.30. Thursday night, Bible study, 7 o'clock. So there's two Bible studies, one on Tuesday, one on Thursday. And this coming Saturday is the men's fellowship. Ken, what are you going to say? Yes. I, I, I don't know. I mean, Tuesday's Independence Day. I didn't. I still depend on God, so we can we can we can still have the Bible study. Look, if you have holiday plans, don't feel it's not a legalistic thing. If you have already have plans for Independence Day, to go do what you got to do. That's fine. But I don't see any reason why we can't still have a Bible study and prayer. All right. Hey, listen. I'll show up. If anybody else shows up, we'll do it. If nobody does, I'll go grill a couple hamburgers or something. Okay? Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Thank you for pointing that out, though. Okay? Men's Fellowship, Saturday morning. Did I say that? Charlie, you good? All right. Men's Fellowship, Saturday morning, 9 o'clock. Okay, Sunday school. Children of Sunday school, come on up here. Come on up here. Deacon Steve is going to pray for you. All right. Come on, guys. Hallelujah. Awesome. Praise God. Yeah. That's the. Let's pray, everybody. Thank you, Lord, for these kids who have come to learn your word. Yes. Thank you for the teacher who's teaching this morning. Yes. I pray that you help them all be blessed by your word to embrace it, to absorb it, to make it the foundation for the rest of their lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now. Uh, first of all, Deacon Chris, can you flip up the switch on the center of each panel? Boom, boom. Beautiful. All right. Revelation chapter 3. Let's go, everybody. Let us pray, and let's get right into God's word together this morning.
our Father in heaven, almighty, holy Lord God, now we come to your word and your word which gives us warning, your word which examines us, your word which causes us to look at ourselves and your word which teaches us your ways and your plans and you reveal yourself in it so much, Lord. Thank you for the Holy Scripture. We pray, Lord God, you'd help us to read it together and study it and learn from it today, that you would work in us, Lord, to be good students, good disciples in your word, and help us with what we learn to go forth and be doers of it and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. Let me read this entire letter again like about the fourth time here now, and uh, just going to read down through verse 13. It's very short, and we'll actually pick up the study in verse 10. But let's read the whole thing. Here we go. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take away your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's us. Praise God. All right. We've been enough weeks in this little section where I don't think I need to review too much, so I just want to dive right into verse 10. So take a look at verse 10 with me, and let's just jump right in there, all right? Here we go. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, let's unpack this verse today, and this will take us some time. Maybe not the entire sermon time, or maybe it will. But let's unpack this verse here, starting with the second half of it, because that's maybe the the most straightforward part of it. You know, I also will keep you, who's I? Jesus. I will keep you, who's you? the Christians of this church that he's writing to, right? And who are the Christians of this church? These are Christians that he has identified as people who have kept his word and have not denied his name. So what Jesus is saying here is those who are his faithful ones, his children, his, the true children of God, the truly born again children of God, he says that he's going to do what for them? He says because, he, well, he links it to the fact that they've kept his command to persevere, which we'll talk about more in detail in a moment. He says, I will keep, I also will, so he's linking the two. The word also links the beginning of it with the end of it, right? You've kept my command to persevere, therefore I also am going to keep you from what? I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. What is that a reference to? That's the easiest question in this entire sermon to answer. Because, obviously, that's a reference to what? The rest of the book, right? 
uh, you read chapters 2 and 3, and you read about Christ's letters to the churches. Then, when you get into chapter 4, you will see the elders gathered around the throne and the whole scene of worship there, which I believe is a reference to the church that is before God now in his kingdom and is worshiping there. Then, when you get to chapter 6, and you follow chapter 6 all the way, especially through chapter 18, but really all the way to the end of the book, what do you get? You get what is called the Great Tribulation. That's the great trial which is coming on the world. And that's very easy to say. Like, if this statement appeared in some other book, perhaps some theological calisthenics would cause you to think that maybe something else was being talked about. But the fact that this is part of the book of Revelation really makes this easy to conclude, right? When he talks about the hour of trial which is coming upon the whole world to test those who walk on the earth, clearly he's talking about what he's about to reveal in the rest of this book and all of that. So what he's doing there is he's pointing ahead to the rest of what's going to come in the book of Revelation, which we will get to not in too much longer, not in too many more weeks. And then those chapters will go faster because we're very deliberately going arduously slow and detailed through these letters here. So, uh, he says what? I'll keep you from it. I'll keep you from that trial, right? Well, there becomes a statement which is contested among many believers, and I, and I believe among true believers. I, I believe that there are many real, sincere, fruitful, God-loving, truly born-again people who interpret that to mean one thing, meaning it's a reference to the rapture and the entire church is going to be raptured out of the world and therefore that's what Jesus means when he says, I'm going to keep you from what's coming. But then there are others, very much our brothers and sisters in Christ, because they love the Lord Jesus and they preach the true gospel of the Lord Jesus and they preach the word of God to try to make disciples and they uh, believe that that's not necessarily a reference to the physical removal of people, but the fact that Jesus would keep them from it, meaning that he would preserve them from the effects of that trial. Like when you read through the circumstances that happen during that trial, and you have all these judgments pouring out on the earth, and you read of like so many people dying in some of these judgments that are coming that it's, it's, it's measured in like percentages, like one third of the population of the earth gets killed. You know, that's all coming here in the upcoming chapters. When Jesus says here, I will keep you from that, what some Christians interpret that is as is the Christians, the churches were still here on the world, but the, but the, but the Lord Jesus promises to preserve his people through that. Right Now, I will tell you that I am in the camp of what you would call a pre-tribulational rapture proponent, but I am, I am, I am non-dogmatically so. And the reason that I'm not dogmatically so is twofold. Number one, Jesus, before he went back to heaven, was asked in the opening of the book of Acts by his disciples, Lord, are you now going to establish the kingdom of God? Does the kingdom start now? And the answer basically was, it was not even for you to know. You know, the Father keeps those things in his own authority. But you're, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you're going to be my witnesses. So, so Jesus, in effect, makes a statement that would seem to imply that kind of the order of things, the establishing of that kingdom, like, isn't even really 100% knowable. It's like only knowable to his father even that he said. So to some extent I believe the reason that there may be some disagreement among true Christians about this is that God simply it does not want us deliberately focusing on yeah well the rapture is going to happen and I'm not going to miss the tribulation. I'm, I'm just going to miss the tribulation anyway. And so what do I care if I walk in holiness? What do I care if I'm faithful? What do I care if I believe? He doesn't want that as well, you know. But still, I still lean towards the fact that I believe the pre-tribulational rapture is a thing because I believe that it is the most literal understanding of Scripture. And when it comes to understanding the Bible, 
I believe that understanding it literally, especially when it comes to eschatology, that is the study of the end times, the study of the last things, that is the way to take it. We'll unpack and unfold a little more of that today and, and then a little more of that as weeks go by. But let's start with this, because before you even get into the business of being kept from that hour, which is going to come to test those who are on the earth, there's this commendation that he makes in the beginning, right? He links it, right? There's a because. When a sentence starts with because, literally, that is a cause of something, and the second part of the sentence is the effect. Because this, then this, right? Because this, then also this. Because you've kept my command, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also am going to keep you. You kept my command, because you kept my command, I'm also going to keep you from what's coming. So, what is this command that Jesus says that they have kept? The command is simply to what? To persevere. And may I say to you, for those of you who are uh, students of and love Calvinism, for example, the P in TULIP is the perseverance of the saints at the end of that acronym, right? Um, Jesus says here what, though? He says, because you've kept my command to persevere, right? So the idea there of command, I think, is that not so much that Jesus is saying, I commanded you to do this, therefore you're going to be saved. I don't know that that's necessarily how he intends it, because that would kind of be a change from everything else the New Testament says about the gospel, right? The gospel, we're clearly taught, has nothing to do with our works. My salvation is not dependent on my ability to do anything, right? I'm saved by God's grace through faith. And so what I think this command is, it's more of an expression of the, the, the absolute condition of what a true Christian is. It's not that in order to be saved, I need to persevere. It's that if I am truly saved, then I am obeying his command to persevere. This is an issue, a flexing, if you will, of the sovereignty of God. If God has truly redeemed you, one of the ways you know that someone is truly redeemed is that they persevere. It's not that we earn redemption by our perseverance. It is that we have received our redemption by God's grace. And if we have received that redemption, one of the manifestations of it, one of the key fruits of it is what? I will persevere. How do I know this? Why do I say this? Jesus taught this. And that's what Jesus is saying, isn't he? Because you have what? Obeyed my command. In other words, because you have walked and lived consistently with what I taught, right? Where did Jesus teach about this? This is so awesome. You know where he taught about this? He taught about this in the parable that he said was the most important of all the parables. We've been over this. You should know this very well by now. There was one parable that Jesus taught that he said, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any of the parables, right? Uh, and all of the parables are earthly stories that portray the spiritual realities of the kingdom of God. The point of the parables was to reveal the kingdom of God to those who had ears to hear, right? And Jesus said of this one particular parable, if you don't get this one, basically you cannot possibly understand the kingdom of God. And that parable was the parable of the, soil. the soils or the sower. Some call it the parable of the sower. Some call it the parable of the soils. I usually say the parable of the sower because I think there's a spot in scripture that it's actually called that. But, but the point of it some people call it the parable of the soils because that's kind of the point of it is the, the seed that gets scattered falls on different types of ground. Let me read a little bit of this to you so you understand this issue of perseverance. So the parable is recorded in a couple of places in Scripture. Reading what it says in Matthew chapter 13, and you can just listen to this. You could go there later and study it if you want. You know how the parable goes. Jesus says, now listen here. Jesus said, a sower goes out to sow, and he sows his seed. Some of it falls by the wayside. Some of it falls on stony ground. We're going we're gonna to focus on that in a minute. Some of it falls among the thorns, and some of it falls on good ground. And then when he's asked to explain it, what that means, 
uh, what he says is the sower is the one who preaches the word, the bringer of the word, God, the one who gives us the word. The seed is the word of God. And though the, so the seed that falls by the wayside, that is people, the word of God is preached, they hear it, they just outright reject it, in one ear, out the other, means nothing to them. The second one, which is the one we're going to emphasize here in a moment, is the seed that falls on stony ground. It's not deep soil. It's just like surface level soil and there's rock bed under it and everything else. And so there's no depth. So the seed falls on that and it sprouts up because a little bit of dirt is enough nutrients to cause a seed to sprout. But once the sun hits it, because it has no depth of earth, it dries up and it goes away. Let me come back to make a point about that just so you remember what the parable is. The third one is the seed that falls among thorns. Those are people who hear the word of God and outwardly they appear to like it and receive it, but the cares of this world, the love of this world, the deceitfulness of money, the lust for money and riches chokes off the fruitfulness of the word in them. And so these are not true believers. That's the point. If you're going to understand the kingdom of God, you've got to understand this. These are not just people who are saved and they struggle. These are not people who are part of the kingdom of God. That's the point. The, the fourth ones are the ones who fall on good soil. They are clearly in the parable set aside as being different from the first three. The seed falls on good ground. There's depth of earth. It grows up. It produces a crop. It produces fruit, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100. Those are the ones who hear the word of God, and they keep it, and they, they walk in it. They believe it. They still battle and struggle, but, man, they grow in the faith, and their lives even produce fruit, which glorifies the Lord. That's the mark of a true believer, right? And when the sun hits that plant, it doesn't dry up. When the sun hits that plant, you know what the plant does? It just sucks in all the nutrients from it and it produces more fruit, which is like us. When tribulation and trials and difficulties hit a true believer, yeah, we're knocked down, but the, we don't stay down. The Lord raises us up and we actually get up with more strength than we had before and we keep going, right? We actually absorb the strength that comes from trials and difficulties. It makes us stronger and more fit and fruitful servants for the Lord. That's the point of the parable of the sower. Now, the one that I want to make a special point about is the, uh, the one where it falls on the stony ground. Because Jesus explained the seed that felt on the stony ground like this. And this is Matthew chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. In modern evangelicalism, that's the end of the story. And that's a problem. That's very problematic because Jesus doesn't leave it there. We're just like, we preach the gospel, somebody hears it, they receive it with joy, hallelujah! And then that's the end of it. But that's not the end of it. What he says is, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. What did Jesus commend the Philadelphia church for? You have, you have kept my command to persevere, which is the same thing as en enduring. You've, you've, through hardships, through trials, even through your own failures, you have kept going. You've kept my command. That is the mark of a true believer. Don't be discouraged if you struggle. Do, do you? Is there, is there? Look, I've been a Christian for well over 30 years now. And I've read through the Bible multiple times, some passages of Scripture, more times than I could ever count. I've preached, I've witnessed to people. I've also sinned and I've failed and I battle and I struggle with my own mind, my own flesh situations in my own house and in my own life, in my own church? Is there anyone here who can educate me and help me? Please, and I mean this sincerely, help me to understand why the Christian life hasn't just been some smooth, easy thing. It's not, though, is it? No. Right? Walking and following and serving the Lord has been a difficult, arduous task. 
right? Reading and studying the Bible is hard. Living day to day for Jesus is hard. This is why Paul says to Timothy, you must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And you endure all of these things as you go along. And what Jesus commends this Philadelphia church for is, you've kept my command to persevere. Right? You've, in other words, and again, I believe that's more the, the sovereignty of God in that I have declared that my children will persevere and I will, I will, I will see to it that they do. That's not, an, that's not like I believe the gospel and I got saved and now I need to earn keeping my salvation by persevering. That, I believe, would theologically not fit with the entire description of what the gospel and the Bible is. It can't be what he means, right? And I don't mean to play like theological algebra there, you know, or, or theological games there, but I really, truly, I believe what Jesus is doing there is he's speaking of his sovereignty. You've kept my command to persevere. You're true believers. That's what he's saying. And in the parable of the sower, which is the parable you need to understand if you're going to understand at all what the kingdom of God is like, the basic foundation, the most important thing that a basic person who's brand new to it, Christianity 101, the basic thing you need to understand is who's saved? Uh, okay, there's a kingdom of God. Who's in it? Right? That's what the parable of the sower teaches. And the ones who receive the word of God with joy, but they have no root in themselves and they only endure for a while. The teaching of the parable is that's not someone who's part of the kingdom of God. Yeah. Not the person who battles and struggles and then gets up and keeps going with the kingdom of God. That's the mark of a true Christian. See? A person who believes the gospel of Christ, but then they show no interest, no growth beyond that. Hey, I'm saved now. They just go back living their carnal worldly life. And over here, you've got a person who receives the gospel of Christ, and it's true, it's real, it's in them. In some respects, the day-by-day -day living of their lives might look exactly like this person over here. Right? Because this person may be struggling and battling and, 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 and maybe succumbing from time to time to things and they need encouragement and they need that nourishment. And they're finding it in God as they confess their sins and they get up. The righteous man, he's knocked down, but the Lord lifts him up and gives him strength and he keeps going. Whereas the person over here is, has got not that care, has not that concern. They endure only for a short time, then they're gone. Jesus went on to say, listen, Listen, the words of Jesus in the parable of the sower. He who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Right? Yet, he has no root in himself. And so he endures only for a while. For, ready? When tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Right? That's what the Philadelphia church didn't do. He commends the Philadelphia church for not being stony ground hearers of the word of God. Do you follow me? And because they are that, because they are true Christians, as manifested by the fact that they persevere even when trials, tribulation, and persecution because of the word comes. And, and by the way, specifically, though trials and hardships can take many forms, what Jesus points to specifically is a specific kind of trial, the kind that comes because of the word. In other words, I'm persecuted because of the word. I'm persecuted because I believe the gospel. I'm persecuted because I trust in Christ. I'm persecuted because I share the gospel with others. I'm persecuted because I try to live my life in accordance with what is taught in scripture. I'm persecuted because I count myself a true disciple of Jesus and I look at Jesus and I want to imitate and follow and obey and serve my master. That's the specific kind of trouble and persecution he's talking about. Do you think that persecution and trouble came to the Philadelphia church? You bet it did. It comes to every church. It comes to us. It comes to you. 
If you truly walk in Christ. Paul, the apostle, wrote to Timothy, he said, those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Just live godly. Just live your life godly in Christ Jesus. You will suffer persecution for it. The mark of a true believer is that they persevere through it. They endure through it. What does it mean to persevere? Doesn't mean you don't stumble. Doesn't mean you don't make a mistake. But when you come through it, you're still there. When the sun hits the leaves or the stem or the sprout of the plant, and then the sun sets and the sun rises the next day, that little seedling is still there because it's endured. That's what we are. That's what we are. We are supposed to endure and we get up and we keep going. It's not that we don't fail. We do. That's why the word tells us that we should confess our sins and that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is an invitation and a promise to believers because we do stumble and fail. I don't say that to make our stumbling and failing okay. You know, don't, you know, that would be a mark of someone who's not a true believer. Oh, it's okay if I go out and do whatever I want because I can just confess my sins. That's someone who's tempting God and is living proudly and loves their own sin, right? But the person who strives for righteousness and strives for obedience and yet they still, they stumble and they fall. The invitation is to confess your sins and receive his blessing and his forgiveness and his cleansing and his restoration and that you come through that still believing. That's the mark of a believer. That's what perseverance is. That's what he commends that church for in Philadelphia. I had Deacon Steve read for you today from Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 is all about the end times. Jesus was asked, the, the passage that Steve read started off by pointing out that Jesus' disciples asked, you know, when are all these things going to happen, you know? I mean, they, I, he, I mean, imagine that, right? Imagine like the disciples taking Jesus through the temple and showing him all the buildings. Look at this building. All right, so, so here's God who spoke and made the stones that became part of the building come into existence from nothing, right? And here's these disciples telling God, wow, look at this, right? So Jesus says, every one of them is going to be thrown down, right? When the end comes. Yeah, you know, and when they hear about the end, their reaction is what? When are these things going to be? So Jesus starts to respond, and part of his response was this. This is part of what Steve read. They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Hated. All nations, all nations, everywhere in the world, they will hate you for my name and my name's sake. Many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Doesn't sound like a very pleasant time to be alive, does it? Hey, welcome. Welcome to Matthew chapter 24, dear brother and sister. I mean, does that not sound like where we live now? And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But, ready? He who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So listen. One of the things that sustains us through persecution and hardship is knowing that persecution and hardship, not only does it work in us to build us up and make us strong, but the increase of that persecution and hardship is a sign that the end is drawing near. And the end drawing near is everything you sang about today. You stand here in church and we sing songs and they're all songs of eagerness for the end to come. I will rise when he calls my name. I want to hear that. 
Jesus Christ is going to part those holy lips of his and my name's going to pass through them? Are you kidding me? What a great blessing. You want to hear that? I want to hear that. That's coming. And the struggles and the hardships that I go through, they're a sign that that's getting closer and closer. And the one who's the true believer, the one who keeps his command to persevere, that's the one that when they come through the trial, they come out bloodied and bruised. Maybe they come out having failed and needed to be picked up again. But their faith is still intact. Mm. And we have this to look forward to. Hallelujah. False prophets rising up. Lawlessness abounding. Every day you watch the news or read something or watch some news video or something. It's like some, it's like some new layer of lawlessness is being promoted as something good and being celebrated. Rejoice, Christian. Your redemption draws near. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Look, today is not the day for complaining Christians. Today is not the day for Christians who moan and complain and are sullen and are despairing because, oh, it's getting so rough out there. Boy, back in my day, blah, blah, blah. You know, the Bible says some things about that. The book of Ecclesiastes actually talks about, do not say that it was better back in the day. Don't say that because it wasn't. People have always been sinful. Hello? People have always been apart from God. People, I mean, when Paul wrote all that stuff in Romans chapter 1, he wasn't writing about the 21st century. He was writing about his century right then and there. All that stuff that we look at and we say, boy, it seems like this is lifted right out of Scripture and is talking about today. Well, yes, that's true. But it was also true at the moment that he wrote it. Right? It's always been that way. I mean, it's very true. It's lawlessness abounds. But listen, we need to love God. This is not the time to... This is not the time for Christians to become complainers and sullen and despondent and discouraged. Get into the word. Get into prayer. Commit yourself to fellowship. Be part, be part of the kingdom of God and its advance. Is anyone with me? Yes. Well, you know that one of the characteristics of love, according to 1 Corinthians 13, 7, is that it what? Endures all things. True love. True love doesn't complain. True love, and true love doesn't cut and run. True love endures all things. Jesus, uh, James, the book of James, in the near the opening of the book of James, it says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You see, that, that's James, right? That's, that's, a, that's a connection between endurance and the crown. Do you understand? Blessed is he who endures temptation for when he has been approved been approved means he has come through the hour of temptation when he has been approved he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him and we saw we've seen in Revelation already and we continue to this crown this this reference to this crown of life this eternal reward that comes the blessing of eternal life with God there again, you see the reality of endurance, enduring temptation, enduring trials, enduring tests, enduring persecution, enduring hardship, enduring, 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 persevering, persevering, persevering. That's the mark of a true believer. The absence of suffering is not the mark of a true believer. The absence of Complaining and turning away from your faith, that is sticking with your faith, that's the mark of a true believer in the midst of that suffering, right? You know, there's this passage in Second Timothy where 
if you read it, if you look at it in your Bible, it's listed out like a, like a, like a psalm almost, or a little hymn, a little saying. And Paul says to Timothy, who he's trying to encourage in the midst of hardship, by the way, he says to Timothy, this is a faithful saying. Ready? And then this list of things. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Well, praise God for that, for that last part, right? But you see what's in the middle of that. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. The mark of a true believer that he's going to reign with Christ one day. And that's what he said in the beginning of this letter to the Philadelphia church that we're talking about. Is He said the, the synagogue of Satan, those who say that they're Jews and they're not, they lie. What did he say? He said, I'm going to make them come and worship before your feet. We're going to reign with him. Well, who's going to reign with him? The one who endures. Enduring hardships, enduring trials, enduring persecution. Not always, we get bloodied and bruised up, but we come through it. And our faith is strong and even stronger and intact. That's the mark of the person who's enduring. Because that's what we're saved by. We're not saved by anything we do or anything we fail to do. What are we saved by? God's grace through? Right? We're saved, faith alone. We, be, we still believe that, right? So the thing that is important to be strengthened in this life while you're here is what? Your faith. Trials do that. Hardship does that. Even our failures and properly coming through those failures through humility and confession, repentance, forgiveness, restoration, even coming through that should make us stronger and stronger and stronger in our faith. Because in the end, that's what your only hope of redemption is, that your faith has made you well. Right? Peter says, in 2 Peter 1, verse 5, but also for this very reason, listen, giving all diligence, right? So giving all diligence, giving all diligence means this is something you're going to put all of your diligence into. All of the best and the first of your strength you're going to put into this. Add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. Now, I don't know that that's necessarily something that has to happen in order. I don't think he's meaning there to give you like a checklist as, as like, okay, now, uh, now I've added enough virtue, so now I'm going to go on to knowledge. I don't think that's what he means. What he means to do is list all of the things that you in your life should be diligent to be adding to the faith that God gave you. God, you did not add your faith to yourself, right? We have been saved by grace through faith, and that what? Not of ourselves, it. it. Faith is what? The gift of God. You have been saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. God grants to you faith to believe. And you believe the gospel and you are saved. But then as you live and as you walk through life, the things that you apply yourself to in your life ought to add these things. And you give all diligence to it. Virtue. Do you give diligence to adding virtue to your faith? Knowledge. Do you diligently try to add knowledge to your faith? Self-control. Do you diligently try to pursue self-control as a building block on top of your faith? Perseverance, which is what the Philadelphia church had done, right? They had persevered and they had kept his word. They must have done this, right? We want to be trained in these things by God. This is why your spiritual disciplines are so important. Your daily Bible reading and meditating on God's word. Your daily time spent with God in prayer. Multiple times even praying. Praying without ceasing. Your time that you spend devoted to the church and in fellowship with the church. This is why this is so important. Right? 
It's so important because you need, listen, God grants you faith, and then we're what? What did Peter say? As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may what? Grow thereby. We want to grow in our what? In our faith. God grants us faith. We believe the gospel. We're redeemed. We're saved. That's the beginning, not the end. Well, it's the end of your life as what you were, but it's the the beginning of your life of what God is going to make you and then carry you into eternity with him where you'll rule and reign with him if you persevere. Right? Which is what he commended the Philadelphia church for. And so you, with all of your diligence, should be applying yourself to your Bibles, to your prayers, to your church, to your fellowship, and adding these things by crying out to the Lord for strength. Because he doesn't say, it, Peter did not say, also for this very reason, giving all diligence, ask God to add to your faith. No. He told them, add to your faith. Give all diligence, add to your faith. That's on you as a believer with his guidance and his help and his strength. Add to your faith virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. So the question is, do you add those things? And the one in view now, especially, is perseverance. Do you diligently pursue being a persevering Christian with God's help and with God's strength? Look, I get prayer requests all the time. The prayer requests are always to heal this person, heal that person, help this person, help that person. That's great, and I pray for every one of them, and we pray for them as a church, and we always will. Nobody ever, 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 ever says, Lou, pray for me that I might grow in perseverance in my faith. Lou, pray for me that I might develop self-control in my life. Well, yeah, I actually have been asked that before. But even more than being asked about that, do you pray about that yourself? Do you pursue those things, right? You all with me here? <sighs> Look. So like, it's Independence Day. And, and Brother Ryan and I were sitting in my office this morning and praying together a little bit before I came out for the service. It was good of him to come in and check on me. Thank you, Brother. And, uh, you know, one of the things that he mentioned in his prayer, which I thought was great, was... It's Independence Day weekend and, you know, one nation under God. And that, you know, to some degree of sincerity and officiality is like a slogan associated with our country, right? One nation under God. Um, it's in the Pledge of Allegiance, right? And people always fight about should the word under God be in there, right? Why do they fight about it? Because... A significant portion of the population of our country is not interested in stating that while we're devoted to the flag and what it represents, we're devoted to our nation, we're not under God. That's the reality, right? So Independence Day, right? What does it celebrate? Independence from the, the empire, right? We broke free from the king of England. irrespective of whether the United States is a nation under God, I do want to tell you this. There is a kingdom coming where every person in that kingdom will be a subject under God. Yeah. If you're in that kingdom, and if you're not in that kingdom, it's because you were not redeemed and you were in hell. You rejected God, you rejected Jesus, you rejected his gospel, or you simply embraced the gospel and embraced God in as much as you thought it fit conveniently and comfortably in your life, but you never wanted to endure any hardship or any suffering for it. You're actually a false believer, and Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. However, if you are one of these true, like, you know, good soil hearers, you know, if you are one of these Philadelphia-type Christians where you keep his command to persevere, fear not! Fear not if the nation you live in doesn't look like one nation under God. Your redemption draws near and you're going to be in one kingdom under one God. And that kingdom will occupy the entire earth and the entire universe. And 
he goes on at the end of this letter, which I still haven't gotten to the end of, to say that one of the things I'm going to do for you is I'm going to write the name of my God on you, I'm going to write the name of the new city, the new Jerusalem on you, and I'm going to write my own new name on you. So on Independence Day, what you ought to urgently do is what? Make sure you're praying to God. Make sure you're seeking the Lord and pursuing the Lord in such a way that you are asking for him to stir up this perseverance in you. Whether or not America ever looks like one nation under God again, I don't know. And in a sense, I love my country, but I don't really care. I mean, I'll do whatever I can to preach to people and say what I need to say. But man, here on out, let it be Jesus. And that's it. I mean, Jesus is coming again one day. And when Jesus comes again one day, it doesn't matter where on earth you are. Every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. He will set his foot on the mountain of, of olives and it will split in two, the prophet said. And he will rule and reign forever and ever. And these Christians who endure and persevere and do not deny his name, they will rule and reign with him. Even his opponents will be made to worship at their feet and to know that Jesus loved them. That's, does that motivate anyone? Anything in you with regards to how you live your life, boy, it does me, and I hope it does you. It shows how I really, in this life, with whatever it has left, whether I reach the end of my natural days or I live to the time when this kingdom happens in its visual form, I want to use my time here now to be devoted to the King of Kings. Jesus taught us to pray, Father in heaven, holy is your name, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Devote your life to that like the Philadelphia Christians did. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the word of perseverance. Help us, Lord, to be your true children, truly faithful to you, walking and persevering even through hardship for your glory. Lord, redemption is only in you. Like we sang about, we also note and remember that you are great Lord Jesus. You came to earth like 2,000 years ago or so, and you gave your life. You died on the cross and you took the penalty for sin. We who are sinful, Lord God, we have no hope of any of this in ourselves, not because we chose the right religion or anything else. Our faith is all wrapped up in the fact that you died for us and you took the penalty for our sins. You satisfied the just requirement of the law in your death. Thank you, God. And you were buried. And you rose from the dead. And you've conquered and destroyed the power of death for those who are your redeemed. Amen. For those who humble themselves and repent and believe the gospel of Christ. Let it be so, Lord God, that everyone in the sound of my voice is a true believer on our Lord Jesus Christ and strengthen us to endure and persevere through hardship to obey your command to persevere. That's connected with what you said you're going to do for those who do. And we'll study that next week, Lord, if you permit. But thank you for this time together today in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up with me, please, and take your hymnals. Let me have the singers come on up here along with Fanny. And let's open up our hymnals, please, to number 350. 350, and let's close by singing a hymn. And that will be the end of our service here today. 350, let's sing, everybody. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. All right. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same. Just in 
Hallelujah. And that's what walking through this life is. It's proving him over and over and over again, right? Proving what? Proving that our faith is rock solidly in the right place, in the right person. You know, you go through trials, you go through hardships, you try to serve the Lord over and over and over again, does not Jesus prove the worthiness of that trust that you have given to him? Like Paul said to Timothy, I know that I have, what I've committed to him, he is able to keep that unto that day, right? He's worthy that we should commit our souls to him, and he's trustworthy that he will keep that which we've committed to him all the way up until that day that his kingdom comes, that we are with him. Hallelujah. So go, go from here now, ready to serve. Go from here. Listen, I need everybody's help. Not me personally. You need each other's help. The church, your church needs you to go this week and do what you've got to do to secure the attendance of some children for our vacation Bible school, man. It's a great, for no other reason other than the wonderful opportunity that it is to meet families. We haven't done this in three years, man. It's been three years since we had this opportunity given to us. Well, we've got the chance to meet a bunch of new people, new children, share the gospel with the kids, share the gospel with their parents, meet them. The only thing that's left to do is do it. I mean, pray, but we've been praying. Continue praying, but now do it. Go out. Think of who you know. When you think to yourself, oh, there's no way that person would come Make that the person you go after. Don't buy that, right? Every one of us, every one of us is someone that nobody thought would come. And here we are, right? Praise the Lord. All right, everyone, God bless you. Remember everything going on here in the life of the church. Have a great day. Enjoy your Independence Day holiday. Deacon Chris, close us with a prayer. God bless you, everybody. Have a great day. Grace and peace to you all. Goodbye.